holders of Bitcoin cannot change the network, which is an argument for holding Bitcoin because it's decentralized. The other narrative that's common in the Bitcoin community is that miners, however, like, like Marathon, for example, have significantly more control over the network and changes to the protocol. Uh, can you address this? Well, I, you know, miners can't change the protocol. At the end of the day, it's a consensus mechanism and you need to have the vast majority of uh, the consensus makers, which are the not just the miners, but also the node operators. There are a lot of node operators that aren't miners, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And if you go back to the period of the block wars in 2017, you had 90 plus percent of the miners wanting something to happen, and it couldn't happen because the node operators wouldn't validate it. Bitcoin halving is coming up in a few weeks. What will likely happen to the price post halving? And what will happen to mining costs post having? We'll talk about these issues with our next guest, Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings, one of the largest Bitcoin miners in the U.S. First, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. iTrust also offers unique tax benefits. So if you'd like to learn more, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below. Remember, if you use my referral link down below, you can also get a $100 U.S. funding bonus if you fund an account with iTrust using that link. Remember, if you're over 18 and you want to open a new account or roll over an existing account, you can do so. Just click on the link in the description down below. Fred, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Great to be here. Uh, let's start by talking about uh, what happened in the last couple quarters since we spoke uh, late last year. Many uh, theories as to why Bitcoin has rallied the way it did. Uh, certainly, the B a Bitcoin ETF approval was one of them. But keep in mind, it was approved in January, and the rally continued since January. Um, was it as a result of the continuous inflows into these ETFs that propelled the price up to current levels, or perhaps it was something else, Fred? Well, I think it's a combination of the ETF approval accelerating the normal um, cycle by about six months. So the, the uptick in the price of Bitcoin, we would have seen in this fall, October, kind of Q late Q3, early Q4 was pulled forward by about six months. Um, you're seeing you know, a very interesting dynamic. Uh, the ETF has attracted capital that previously was invested in mining equity stocks. So stocks in companies like Marathon, some of that flowed uh, out of those stocks and into the ETFs. And then you also have considerable outflows. You know, GBTC has seen almost 50% outflows of its original Bitcoin balance from um, when the ETFs launched. Um, and so now you're now seeing significant outflows from GBTC, a lot of which has likely flown back into the other ETFs. Uh, you had a lot of people who bought shares in GBTC at 40% discount when Bitcoin was at fifteen and $20,000. And um, now they're obviously monetizing that and then reinvesting some of those proceeds. But essentially, most of the ETF inflows have really been retail dollars at this point. You know, it's still as an institution, a little bit hard to um, invest in these ETFs. And as anybody who maybe banks with B of A or some of these other large banks finds, um, you know, you have to literally ask permission to almost buy these ETFs through the banks if you're using their brokerage accounts. So yeah, I think we're still early in the adoption cycle from the ETFs. But essentially what's happened is the normal Bitcoin cycle has moved forward by about six months. Um, so I think we're going to see a kind of bumpy sideways road here around 70K. Um, you know, if Bitcoin breaks through 70k with strong momentum then we may see another um, run up but um, i think at some point here the market has to consolidate uh, we've already seen uh, some of that happening on the equity side i think we're going to start seeing it here on the, the etf and the spot market side i know you don't usually give price predictions so i won't ask you that explicitly but i would ask you to uh, address or um respond to uh, kathy wood of arcs predictions uh, she has updated her forecast a few months ago. She now sees six hundred thousand dollars by three twenty thirty. That's the base case, uh, perhaps one point five million. I think it's. I think the assumption here is that Bitcoin will continue to advance alongside technological innovation. I think that's always been her um, underlying assumption here. Can you just address that forecast, uh, whether or not it makes sense to you? <clears throat> well, 
if you think that Bitcoin historically has grown, increased in value anywhere from 20 to 35% a year, kind of on average over the period of time, then, you know, at 70,000 today going forward to 2030, you're looking at six years. Yeah, 30% a year appreciation. That's totally doable. Um, we don't look out quite that far. I mean, we limit our outlook, um, you know, kind of internally to about 2028. And while we don't publish pricing forecasts, um, you know, we believe that likely, and this is more really my personal uh, belief, that Bitcoin really, if we look at the short term, will end this year somewhere between 50 and 100K. It's hard to tell. Um, next year, likely getting close to 200K potentially. Uh, at the high end, otherwise, most certainly somewhere in the 125 to 150 range, most probably. And then it's a question of does the cycle repeat and you have a bit of a bear market? Or are we done with historical cycles and because of the ETFs and longer holding institutional interest in Bitcoin, do we start seeing less volatility, which also means potentially less price appreciation? Um, on a long-term basis, uh, other than that driven by pure you know, supply and demand. You know, again, most people think of Bitcoin and compare it to gold or other commodities. The key difference between Bitcoin and gold is that there's a finite supply. There's only 21 million Bitcoin, arguably 4 million of that 21 million have been lost, and we still have yet to mine about a million of it. So you're talking about potentially 16 million Bitcoin that could be tradable on any given moment. Um, most Bitcoin sits uh, off exchanges in cold wallets, hasn't moved in six to nine months. Over half of Bitcoin hasn't moved in five years, uh, all of which says at some price point that Bitcoin will move, of course. But I believe that with a finite amount, if you start seeing, you know, 1% um, of 401k assets beginning to be allocated to this type of an asset class over the next, say, five to 10 years, uh, there's not enough supply to uh, provide that level of investment in Bitcoin without the price going up significantly. So I, I think all of the longer term indicators are that price will go up. The question is by how much and how fast and will there be um, profit taking and drops along the way? The one thing I think that is certain is while longer term volatility will decrease in the short term, because of the amount of Bitcoin that's not on exchanges and the time it takes to get Bitcoin to exchanges from off-chain wallets, uh, we'll see a lot of volatility in the price. You know, swings of 10% in a day will be normal fodder, I think. Well, it, it's not normal today? Um, you know, I think what you've seen is typically Bitcoin has been, for the past year, quite stable, actually, with little spurts of run-ups. But you look more recently in the past few weeks, you've seen a couple of days with a 10% drop or fluctuation in the price of Bitcoin intraday. And um, while if Bitcoin's at 600 and it moves $60, people don't react. Well, when Bitcoin's at 68,000 and it moves $6,800, people do react. Um, so again, it's just a question of the volatility. Your outlook for Bitcoin, uh, is it factoring in market forces for stocks or the broader economic landscape? Or do you think Bitcoin, per your forecast, will move more or less independently based on its own supply demand fundamentals. So you have to look at what money it is that is going into Bitcoin that is creating the demand. So you have normal demand that is, you know, if uh, the markets are moving towards a risk on bias, then you're going to start seeing more capital allocated to higher risk assets, which would obviously benefit Bitcoin. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the equity markets are going up at the same time. You can look at the macroeconomic situation today, and what you're seeing is one where you have persistent inflation pressures, you have persistent geopolitical pressures, and um, let's just say exogenous events that are causing some of that uh, inflation to remain very sticky. Geopolitical situation in the um, Suez area, that's creating shipping challenges. Uh, you now also have the Port of Baltimore issues, which is another exogenous event that's gonna create some form of impact on the inflation side. Uh, while you're starting to see unemployment tick up, many industries, especially on the services side, still haven't seen the downtick in employment. Manufacturing has seen it. So I think that we're 
either going to go into a recessionary period, in which case people may decide to put actually more money into assets like Bitcoin, which tend to be anti-inflationary and maintain value. Um, but at the same time, there'll be less risk assets available. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Bitcoin behaves because it acts a little bit like a chameleon or a leopard rather, in that it changes its spots. Uh, you know, if you go back to during the period of COVID and all those subsidies, there was a lot of money, people bought a lot of Bitcoin, things like that, stocks, et cetera. Then we had um, the drop in Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin started acting like an inflation hedge again. So Bitcoin changes its meme, if you would, uh, and its bias a little bit depending on the types of investors who are buying or selling Bitcoin at any given moment. And I think what we're going to continue to see is Bitcoin have more uh, pressure to move price upwards than to move price downwards in the near term. One group of not so much investors, but entity that could hold Bitcoin is probably just corporations. You and I spoke about the changes in the FASB accounting rules um, last year, late last year. It happened in December of 2023. FASB issued the accounting standards update 2023-08, uh, uh, which basically uh, allows companies to record crypto holdings at fair value, where uh, changes in fair value to be recorded in the net income, uh, rather. Uh, this is a change from prior accounting standards where uh, crypto assets were accounted for at cost less impairment. Uh, what do you think this change means for companies and whether or not it would incentivize companies to hold more or less Bitcoin? Well, I think it clarifies how Bitcoin uh, is reported, which is nine tenths of the battle in this case, because if a company is going to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, they have to have a very clear ability to hold to report on it and investors in those companies have to have a very clear ability to understand um, how the value of that bitcoin is going to change over time and by the old standard where you could only impair its value your know, bitcoin might have been at a hundred thousand and it that bitcoin may have been impaired down to fifteen thousand which was kind of the low point of the most recent drawdowns um and you would have this delta between the real market value of the asset versus the book value now there's clarity you essentially it's mark to market treatment which makes it much easier so essentially a company will hold bitcoin on their balance sheet just like they hold cash now does that mean they'll hold they're likely to hold more of their assets in bitcoin i think over time yes it's going to take a while but i think you're starting to see uh companies begin to evaluate it as a way to store cash uh you know your alternatives today are to put money into uh, T bills, uh, you're going to get five percent, five and a half percent, something like that. So, what's the alternative? And Michael Saylor has, for years, been the advocate of taking corporate assets and putting them into Bitcoin. And while he has uh, accumulated more Bitcoin than most companies would feel comfortable with, uh, it certainly has worked out quite well for him. So, I think it's really something that companies are going to evaluate. But it's not just companies; it's countries are also evaluating this. There are sovereigns who want to hold assets in Bitcoin. Why? Because it can't be controlled by another government. And having sovereignty over your assets is very important, especially as a commodity producer. Um, so I think you're going to start seeing more countries holding small amounts of Bitcoin in their balance sheet uh, as Bitcoin begins to continue to permeate the institutional investor base. And then you're going to see all sorts of derivative products that are Bitcoin um, uh, related uh, products. You'll see uh, options. You'll see the funds that short Bitcoin versus go long Bitcoin. You'll see all sorts of different investment instruments that companies will be able to use uh, to get exposure to Bitcoin without actually having to hold Bitcoin in a wallet. So I think uh, the fact that it's now readily available with institutions, you know, you could go to Fidelity and buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, spot Bitcoin directly, uh, you can use ETFs, you can use all sorts of different things uh, that make it easy for corporations to hold it. And now with this new reporting, it's easy to report on it. And uh, are there any technological innovations built on the Bitcoin layer one that may prompt people to hold more Bitcoin that you're looking out for? Well, I think on layer one, it's more about the fact that you know, Bitcoin is the most secure place to store something. Um, and so what you're really going to see is innovation on layer two, where because there's only one Bitcoin block minted every 10 minutes, that level of transaction speed 
um, does not work well for Bitcoin to act as a medium of payment, but it does work well as a store of value. And so what you're going to see is more systems like Lightning built on layer twos with Bitcoin that act as that means of payment. You're going to see all sorts of data stored at layer two with the security anchored in the Bitcoin blockchain. You're going to see digital identity products launched, which is likely the next big use of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, where people will essentially have a digital ID. It's a Think of it as a token that once you have validated your identity with some form of authority, say a bank, government, whatever it might be, they issue a token that is now your ID, your KYC, if you would. Uh, and whenever you need to do a transaction with somebody and they need to validate your ID, you simply show the token and um, they can validate that it's real without getting the underlying data. It's part of this concept of zero knowledge proofs. And when you get to that level, then people can have trust without actually having the underlying knowledge about the person because there will be a token that validates their, they are who they are um, and they have done full KYC. Same thing with your health data. You go to a medical professional, you give them access to your health data via token. They can use it, they can read it, they can update, add new data to it, uh, but they can't copy it. And then when they're done using it, they no longer have access to it. And it will absolutely kill ransomware. There's no way for ransomware to operate if it can't re-encrypt the blockchain, which it can't do. So. Speaking of the uh, the network itself, so I've heard uh, the narrative that holders of Bitcoin cannot change the network, which is an argument for holding Bitcoin because it's decentralized. It doesn't matter how many Bitcoins one particular entity holds, that particular entity cannot have more control over the network than somebody who owns maybe only a fraction of one Bitcoin. Uh, the other narrative that's common in the Bitcoin community is that miners, however, like, like Marathon, for example, have significantly more control over the network and changes to the protocol. Uh, can you address this narrative? Well, I, you know, miners can't change the protocol. At the end of the day, it's a consensus mechanism and you need to have the vast majority of uh, the consensus makers, which are the not just the miners, but also the node operators. There are a lot of node operators that aren't miners, um, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And if you go back to the period of the block wars in 2017, you had 90 plus percent of the miners wanting something to happen and it couldn't happen because the node operators wouldn't validate it. So it's a consensus mechanism and you have to have over 50% of the consensus contributors, the node operators, miners, et cetera, all vote for and signal for something. So as an example, when Taproot, which was one of the more recent changes to the Bitcoin core network uh, was approved, it was approved because Miners signaled they were going to accept it and node operators did as well. And eventually you got to 90% and it was approved. So there's a very high hurdle for anybody to change anything programmatically in the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and then the only way somebody could change data that's recorded on the blockchain is to do a proverbial 51% exploit, which is virtually impossible because of the sheer cost to do it. You would have to accumulate as much compute power and energy to run that as 51% of the existing miners uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain, which would mean you would have to have over 300 exahash of capacity. The minute you add 300 exahash of capacity to the network, total network capacity would go to 900. You would now have to grow to 450. And then every time you're adding, you're only making your number bigger. <laughs> And so it, it, is, it becomes hundreds of billions of dollars to even try to do an exploit. So um, you know, the long of it is to change the software protocol, it takes the vast majority of people involved with mining and node operators, which is a very high hurdle. Um, and to try and change, go ahead. Can miners ahead. theoretically band together and perhaps just as one example, change the hard cap of 21 million? No. Is that, that's not mathematically possible? No, because it's not for the miners to do. You have to change it in the actual code of Bitcoin. So miners would have to choose to fork Bitcoin to something else and then do that. That's essentially what happened in 2017 is you had a fork. You had Bitcoin cash, as it's called, or classic Bitcoin, and then you have current Bitcoin. And uh, while there are still people that mine Bitcoin cash, it is much, much smaller than Bitcoin. 
Um, and the Bitcoin that we have today is uh, based on true consensus. So yes, you could, group of miners could band together and fork Bitcoin, but they would have to get the vast majority of the users of the Bitcoin blockchain to go with them, which they're not going to do very easily if they're changing the hard cap. Right. Um, can you explain the relationship between the hash rate and the price? Is there a definitive causation for one variable to affect the other? <clears throat> well, hash rate doesn't necessarily change price. It's the other way around. As the price of Bitcoin goes up and the profitability of mining goes up, miners are incentivized to add more capacity. And when they add more compute, the global hash rate goes up. So think of the hash rate as the sum of all the compute power applied to the Bitcoin blockchain. So and, miners can't, and, in theory, miners can't hypothetically collude to just, you know, lower the hash rate and bump up the price. Would that make any sense? No. Well, if you lower the hash rate again, the hash rate doesn't drive price. Price drives hash rate. It's the other way around. So if the price of Bitcoin drops, if the price of Bitcoin drops dramatically, hash rate will drop because a lot of people won't be able to mine Bitcoin profitably. If the price of Bitcoin goes up dramatically, more people will order, you know, more miners will order more machines. They'll build more capacity because there's more profit to be extracted. In that way, Bitcoin operates very much like gold or petroleum markets. You know, if the price of oil drops, oil producers shut down their oil rigs and their production. If it goes up, they turn them back on. It's the same thing with Bitcoin miners. You add capacity when price is high, you shut down capacity when price is low. Well, let's talk more about mining itself. Uh, you are an expert on Bitcoin mining after all. Uh, let's talk about having. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. How do you think the Bitcoin mining costs would be affected post happening? Well, essentially, your marginal cost to produce will double. Uh, so to produce a Bitcoin, if today it costs you, I'll use $20,000 as a round number to produce Bitcoin, then, uh, and that is your cost of energy um, to produce Bitcoin, then your cost to produce a Bitcoin post having would be $40,000 um, notionally. There are some slight differences. Your operating expense that is non-energy related relative to mining Bitcoin, it does not double. That cost doesn't double. It just takes twice as much compute to generate the same number of Bitcoin. And so what ends up happening is essentially, if you have <clears throat> you know, 10% uh, of the Bitcoin network in your mining fleet, uh, the capacity of the Bitcoin uh, network, then instead of producing um, 90 Bitcoin a day, you're going to get 450 Bitcoin a day, but the amount of energy you're expending is gonna cost you the exact same. So that 45 Bitcoin will cost you what 90 Bitcoin costs to produce before the halving. Right. And suppose the price doesn't appreciate to the same extent as the mining costs do. Uh, what would the miners do in that case? Would they scale back on, on, on mining or would they realize a loss? What would be the appropriate course of action from someone like Marathon? It, it depends on the nature of the energy contracts. If you have energy contracts that are per power purchase agreements where you have to take it or pay it, meaning you either consume the energy or you're just going to pay for it anyway, then there is um, a no real incentive to shut down completely because if you were to shut down completely, you're still paying for the energy, but you're generating zero revenue. However, you would have an incentive to keep at least operating, seeing as you're paying for the energy and you'll generate some revenue and it'll cover some of your cost. So there's a, a, a reason to keep producing even if it's at a loss because it's less of a loss than if you just shut down completely. In the event where you have an ability to sustain that because you have cash on your balance sheet as a miner, then you know that could go on for a long period of time, potentially. Um, in the event you are able to uh, tell the power company, I'm not gonna take this power, it's yours and you don't have to pay for it, then yes, those, those miners will likely shut down immediately um and wait out the uh, the drop in the in the price well what do you anticipate could happen to bitcoin post happening this cycle uh people have speculated that it will just history will just repeat itself because bitcoin has always gone up in prior happening cycles and so why would this time be any different um have you observed any evidence that this time could be different well, I think you need to look at uh, the supply shock. Right now, we have a demand shock because of the ETFs. That's what's been driving price up. 
Um, as you get to, and that's, uh, you know, a, a demand shock to the tune of about 2,000 Bitcoin a day. Uh, if you look at the having, we're going to go from having 900 newly minted Bitcoin a day to 450 a day. So you're taking the total new emissions of Bitcoin, if you would, the total supply that is being newly introduced on a daily basis will go down by 50%. We'll go to 450 Bitcoin. In a day when typically four to 5,000 Bitcoin are trading hands, a decrease of 450 in new supply will likely have some impact on price, um, though it's hard to determine what it might be. So there's going to be a small supply shock. It's not a big supply shock. It's a small supply shock, but it's still 10 to 15% of typically the liquidity in the marketplace. And again, these halving events will have less impact on the price of Bitcoin over time as liquidity in the market for Bitcoin increases. So if 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 Bitcoin are trading hands uh, a day, um, then that's very different than if only a couple thousand Bitcoin are changing a day, right? So it's very likely that what we'll see is there'll be some upwards pricing pressure on Bitcoin um, post having. And uh, again, as I said earlier, when we were talking about price predictions, you know, likely we'll end this year above the all, former all time high. Um, and then we'll see another run up likely in 2025 as more adoption happens. But it's really the cycle post the peak. Um, so post the next year peak that will be different going forward. And that's something we just it's a hard to tell because it's a question of institutional demand for Bitcoin. And uh, how's that going to change? Will adoption continue at this current pace, in which case there will continue to be a deficit in available Bitcoin in the marketplace? So there'll be a continued demand shock. So price will go up. There'll be scarcity uh, in the event all of a sudden uh, there is some major event that causes the price of Bitcoin to drop. You may see a supply glut, in which case you may see price decrement uh, quickly. I, I think we're in unknown territory and everybody is, I think uh, many people are betting on the long term that yes, it's going to go up, so I'll keep investing. But people are kind of keeping their fingers crossed that something doesn't dramatically change negatively uh, while they're making these investments. We're very optimistic about longer term opportunities with Bitcoin and obviously what we're doing and how we're investing. And I think the rest of the industry is on a very similar track. Speaking of mining production, are there any energy commodities that you think have the most impact on uh, the production of Bitcoin? For example, uh, suppose access to natural gas or oil were limited because of tensions in the Middle East or attacks on supply lines. Uh, which commodities would have the most impact on Bitcoin production? Well, it's the same commodities that have an impact on inflation in this country. And the reason I couch it that way is if energy prices go up, it affects the consumer. Uh, that is inflation. And that effect on the consumer is something the Fed is very focused on. And, you know, they're fighting two battles, inflation and unemployment. So if you see high pressures on energy costs, which means energy prices are going up, gasoline's going up, natural gas will go up, all those things will go up. Uh, impacts Bitcoin miners, yes. Bitcoin miners typically have longer term agreements for energy prices. Uh, they're hedging their bets, just like any large industrial company hedges its commodity risk. Um, but that being said, you're going to have a Fed that is going to want to accommodate and loosen to keep those inflationary pressures from driving, which will then bring uh, easy money into the market, which will impact the price of Bitcoin which will drive it above whatever the commodity cost increase is. And that's been kind of the historical norm. But right now we have a glut in natural gas pricing. I mean, natural gas pricing is uh, way below where it was a year ago, uh, primarily driven by the fact that on the one hand, we can't export more LFG than we do today. And uh, the, all that natural gas is backing up in the market here locally. And uh, the U.S. today is producing more oil and natural gas than it has in history one of the largest producers in the world. And uh, until that stops, I think, um, you know, we'll continue to see 
uh, you know, good good pricing uh, on commodities. Well, let's just take Marathon Digital as an example. Um, what energy sources are predominantly behind the production of your Bitcoin? So we're we're, we're predominantly renewable. So fifty six percent is solar, wind, etc. Um, and the balance is a mix of natural gas, nuclear, other things. So the natural gas component of our energy mix is obviously impacted by commodity pricing. You know, solar and wind, the good thing is uh, there's no marginal cost really to producing that electricity. And so uh, those prices remain fairly constant. What we're also doing is we're very focused on moving into an area we call energy harvesting. And this is where we're taking true stranded energy in the form of methane gas, landfill biomass, and other sources of energy, converting that into electricity and then using Bitcoin mining as a way to generate heat, which we can then sell back into an industrial process or another commercial use case. What that means is essentially as a Bitcoin miner, my costs could potentially go to zero. And when my cost for energy is zero, then I can mine Bitcoin no matter what the price of Bitcoin is, no matter um, what so, the global so, hash rate is. Can you just elaborate one more time? How would the cost go to zero, hypothetically? Well, because, uh, for example, there are uh, situations where you can be paid to take biomass or you can be paid to mitigate methane. So you take methane flare, you mitigate it, you get renewable energy credits for that. Those credits can be sold for quite a lot of money. Um, you then generate electricity with the methane gas or the landfill gas or the biomass. Um, that electricity has essentially cost you nothing because you're getting paid for the, the renewable energy credits or you're being paid to mitigate uh, or take that biomass and process it. And then if you can sell the heat from the Bitcoin mining operation, Bitcoin miners are great sources of heat. And if you capture the heat and reuse it, by the way, 50% of the energy used by industry today is used for heating things. So there is a natural um, virtuous cycle between taking biomass and uh, waste essentially from certain process industries, reusing that to create energy and then feeding the heat back into the industrial process. You are now being paid to take a waste product, process it. You're being paid for the heat you're producing for it. And this is before you've even mined a Bitcoin. And then those two revenue sources can offset potentially your energy cost for mining Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, if somebody were to say to you, well, I guess at least my next question, if somebody were to say to you, I'm concerned about whether or not a Bitcoin miner as a business is sustainable over the long term. I'm talking about decades down the line as the cost of money inevitably go up to a point where it may not be sustainable for many businesses or that computing power becomes so great that, well, the necessary computing power becomes so great that we no longer have the capacity to mine Bitcoin at scale. How would you respond to that? Well, I'd say two things, uh, or actually three things. One, uh, there's a floor on what energy costs, right? Uh, natural gas pricing won't fall below a certain level. Um, wind, solar won't fall below a certain level. Uh, so there's a floor on to how low commercial energy pricing can go. Uh, the only way to get your energy cost lower is to generate your own energy, as I just explained a minute ago. And so um, what will happen is eventually commercial energy will become too expensive for Bitcoin miners to use. Why? Well, for one thing, you're going to see a um, with more batteries at utility scale, more energy storage mechanisms at the edge, such as homes with solar and battery systems, the curve on energy demand during the day, the duck curve, as we call it, which typically has a lull. Um, uh, there's a glut in the middle of the day and a shortage in the evenings uh, to simplify it. That will normalize because people will take that energy produced at the middle of the day when there's too much of it because there's lots of solar and lots of wind and they'll store it and then they'll make it available at night when there's a shortage, when the sun's not shining, for example. So as soon as you even out the cost of the amount of electricity that's being pulled by the grid, that evens out the cost, then Bitcoin miners are going to be incentivized to go look at alternative ways of generating energy because they can't play this role of load balancer on the grid anymore. The other thing that's happening, and the more important delta, is the AI industry has um, potentially 10 times the demand for energy that Bitcoin ever could have. 
And it's already growing to the point where it's going to be eclipsing Bitcoin soon. What that means, and they are prepared to pay much higher prices for energy. So Bitcoin miners will essentially be squeezed out of markets where AI data centers could potentially operate because they are willing to pay higher prices for energy. They're willing to pay higher prices for infrastructure. A typical AI data center is a eight to 12 times more expensive infrastructure investment than Bitcoin mining. And the only similarity they have is they both consume energy uh, to a great scale. So Bitcoin miners will over time be forced to essentially go into the business of generating their own energy or finding energy that is free essentially. Um, and doing things where Bitcoin mining is just a byproduct of what they're doing. And I think that is the long-term um, trend for Bitcoin mining. And it also means Bitcoin mining will move from large utility scale sites, which is the typical standard today, down to a long tail of small uh, implementations where it's maybe one megawatt, two megawatt, three megawatt. And that requires systems that are very self-contained, very redundant, uh, very automated. And that's the core of our technology investments. Over the past few weeks, we've announced a number of technologies that essentially will form the basis for the ability to mine fully remote, fully hands-off, small scale, with very high efficiency uh, anywhere. Uh, well, do, do you see U.S. miners continuously being competitive with other miners in other regions? In other words, how can you remain competitive um, with miners in regions that may be more pro Bitcoin or crypto friendly in nature? Well, I think it's more miners are going to continually chase cheap energy. So if energy becomes too expensive in the US, miners are going to go to Latin America, where there's lots of stranded energy, they're going to go to Africa, where there's lots of stranded energy, and you don't have these grid balancing components that create big incentives for batteries or other utilities, you have other issues. And so the, Miners will continue to chase large energy sources that are inexpensive internationally. They're going to deal with regime risk, all of the other issues related to operating in those countries. Um, but I think the longer term, if you look over the course of the next two decades, Bitcoin mining will migrate to the long tail. It will move away from utility scale. Bitcoin mining will be built into all sorts of industrial processes such that it's really just a way people are generating heat. Um, and then, oh, by the way, they're also mining Bitcoin at the same time. Are you interested in pursuing a strategy of acquisitions, which is to say acquiring smaller miners to diversify your portfolio? Yes, we've been doing that uh, over the past uh, recent months. We've done two major acquisitions, uh, acquiring hosted providers where we actually had some of our miners running. So we've now transitioned our fleet from uh, really, 3% uh, owned and operated back in December to now over 54% owned and operated when you think about the actual physical infrastructure and the sites. And we'll continue to do that um, both for growth purposes and also for uh, vertical integration purposes. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, which, which jurisdiction in the world does have the cheapest energy in abundance? Oh, gosh. The U.S. is... Uh, definitely a leading source um parts of texas uh if you have the right type of ppa can be very attractive uh there are parts of africa where you can find very attractive energy costs um and there are parts of latin america too so it's it's available all right um finally uh are you ever concerned about computing power not keeping up with the demands of bitcoin mining um if bitcoin mining requires more and more computing power in the future. Are you concerned about us not having enough of this power to make Bitcoin mining at scale efficient? Well, if you think about what it is that makes Bitcoin mining efficient, part of it is the amount of energy that the mining rigs, the compute power consumes to generate one tera hash, or think of it as uh, you know one horsepower of compute power. Um, and you know, if that progression downwards uh, in cost to produce a Bitcoin ceases to happen, uh, yeah, you then have to seek efficiencies in other places, which means getting lower cost energy. You have multiple inputs, if you would. Uh, you know, if you have free energy, for example, if you have solar panels in your backyard, you can use old technology to mine Bitcoin because your energy efficiency is not important. But um, if you're doing it at scale, 
yeah, you want to have the latest and greatest always. And, you know, nowadays you have U.S.-based companies developing technology for Bitcoin. It's not just offshore companies. And so I think we're going to continue to see, like any technology industry, uh, continued innovation. Great. Well, Fred, I appreciate your time. Where can we learn more about um, either yourself or Marathon? You can find me on Twitter at uh, F-G-T-H-I-E-L or Fred at Mara.com my email address or just mara.com m-a-r-a.com okay perfect we'll put those links in the description down below thank you very much for your time today fred thank you thank you for watching don't forget to like and subscribe